You discussed the asymmetrical threats in the Gulf region at a recent uh, National Council on U.S.-Air Relations conference here in Washington, D.C. We'd like to ask you, uh, what are those threats and what does it mean for U.S. forces and interests in the region? Thank you for the question. It's a very timely and relevant one. Um, first off, you have the tactical nature of the threat, and then you have to consider the strategic threat. Most the, the strategic threat to the GCC from both the GCC perception and I would argue from the perception of the West is the threat posed by Iran. Uh, the GCC members feel that the United States has and other Western countries, but in particular the United States, which is the primary security guarantor of the Gulf, mm -hmm. have not yet woken up to the true nature of the Iranian threat. In their telling of this, the Iranian threat has three parts. The first part is a unconventional uh, campaign of meddling, sedition, uh, subversiveness uh, by Iran and what is seen as Iranian proxies in Hezbollah across a whole arc that's aimed at isolating and encircling the GCC by f things such as fomenting rebellion in uh, the eastern province of Saudi Arabia and Bahrain uh, among the Shi'i in Yemen. Um, most people in the West think that uh, Iran is certainly eager to capitalize off these things, but that their role in instigating these are, are somewhat overstated. That, for example, in Bahrain, uh, most Western observers feel that you have legitimate grievances uh, from the Shi'i population there that the Iranian government has been uh, very quick to exploit. Uh, the second area of concern is the rise in Iranian conventional but asymmetric weapons capabilities, and we're primarily talking about missiles here. The development of Iranian missiles, uh, not necessarily as the delivery device for a nuclear weapon, but rather uh, as a delivery device for a conventional capability. And this is rapid, this is increasing, and this is disturbing. And then the third uh, development is, of course, the development of the Iranian nuclear program, and this is where a majority of the Western effort has been focused on uh, deterring and negotiating for the Iranian, uh, to stop the Iranian nuclear program. The paradox here, from the GCC perspective, or from the perspective of many in the GCC, is that the Western focus on the Iranian nuclear program seems to have given the Iranians a blank check to do all these other things to uh, foment uprisings and to meddle in domestic Arab politics, domestic GCC politics, and to continue with the development of asymmetric conventional weapons, primarily with missiles. So that's the main focus of concern. The implications of this for the West are pretty significant, particularly for the United States. One thing that Prince Turki Al Faisal said in his address to the National Council on U.S. Arab Relations, which was widely seen as a airing of Saudi grievances with the United States was that the United States had decreased its aircraft carrier presence in the Gulf. When I look at developments, regional developments in military uh, weaponry, and I look in especially at the miniaturization of weapons and the proliferation of missiles, it seems to me that focusing on that sort of capital and personnel intensive military assets is misguided. Uh, the fact of the matter is, if not now, in 10 years or 20 years, but at some time in the future, missiles are getting so cheap and it is so difficult to deter them that sooner or later, a country like Iran, which has a, a wide variety of missiles, which has an industrial base, which has the capability to build missiles, will be able to defeat defensive characteristics. If you look at the 2006 Israel-Hezbollah war, the Israeli Air Force flew about 15,000 sorties, combat aircraft sorties, in southern Lebanon. Hezbollah managed to launch about 3,000 rockets, 3,000 to 4,000 rockets. So you're looking at about a 3 to 1 ratio, 3, 3 and a half to 1 ratio of sorties to deter uh, rockets. Now granted, some of these sorties were conducted in support of ground attack forces and things of that nature. But the fact remains and the math, I think, is against uh, the traditional Western approach of sending a large aircraft carrier as a show of force. It is becoming increasingly cheaper to build missiles that will cost millions of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars that, if not now, at some point in the future, will be able to defeat a very expensive, a multi-billion dollar defense asset. And given the fact that our presence in the Gulf uh, you know, our provision of security there is primarily in our economic interests. History has shown that when the United States 
uh, suffers a major military setback, or any Western country, um, if, if a perceived vital national interest is not at stake, they withdraw. They withdraw. So you consider uh, the United States, uh, Italy, France, Britain withdrawing Marines from Beirut after the bombings in 1982, or the, uh, prolonged, the withdrawal from Iraq after the prolonged campaign there. Uh, my fear is that if we continue to rely on these large, lumbering, capital-intensive, uh, basically industrial age warfare uh, projections of power against an increasingly nimble, asymmetric threat, uh, that the chances are we will be vulnerable and that our interests will not be preserved. So what I look to and what I expect to see in the Quadrennial Defense Review, which is coming out uh, in the next few weeks, is what Secretary Hagel spoke of at the Manama Dialogue this past December. I think that what we'll see is the American presence will increasingly rely on enabling, training, and equipping our partners in the GCC states to defend themselves in a way that allows them to have robust capabilities, uh, to include capabilities they haven't had before, such as standoff ground attack weapons, which have just been approved for sale to the UAE and Saudi Arabia in the last six months for the first time ever and also uh, a mixture of more appropriate surface combatant ships such as minesweepers and coastal patrol craft. A presence that is not large and hulking but rather small, nimble and agile will better serve our purposes and I think that's what we're going to see in the GCC in the future. You bring up in an article that will be published soon uh, that the GCC members may consider acquiring missile defense capabilities to counter a potentially nuclear Iran in the future or in the near future. Uh, could the U.S. help and collaborate with the building of those capabilities in the GCC uh, member states? And uh, do you envisage a common uh, or multinational uh, missile defense shield, or would each nation be more likely to develop their own missile defense? Missile defense is perhaps the greatest area where I think we're going to see increased defense cooperation between the United States and the Gulf Cooperation Council. Right now, a number of GCC countries, Bahrain, Qatar, Oman, don't have missile defense capabilities. Uh, Saudi Arabia, UAE, and Kuwait have a limited missile defense capability, uh, mostly with Patriot missiles. Um, what we've seen, though, in missile defense, the engineering case for missile defense, is that a multinational web is much stronger than a series of unilateral webs or even bilateral missile defense systems in which each individual GCC country cooperates and relies upon the United States for certain elements of its capability. When one seeks to engineer an effective missile defense system, what you look for is robustness, resilience, redundancy, uh, and you can't really get that in, uh, in one country. For example, uh, a missile defense network is more effective if, say, the acquisition sensors, the radar that acquires a missile in the boost phase, is located in a different country than where the, the interceptors are launched from. And to the extent that we can encourage GCC member states to pool their assets and share a common operating picture, which will be integrated with the United States, I believe, uh, that's an encouraging thing. The uh, U.S. is pushing for a Gulf Cooperation Council U.S. Minis defense ministerial meeting to be held sometime in the spring. Uh, missile defense, I suspect, will be a major item there. Uh, and to be honest, the United States are the world leaders in missile defense, so this is a natural area for us to collaborate on. Uh, in the past, most of these countries have been very happy to deal with the United States. Uh, they've been less willing to deal with each other. But I think it's a paradox. There are hurt feelings over the Western rapprochement to Iran. They recognize that the missile threat comes from Iran. Uh, paradoxically, that perceived, uh, you could almost say abandonment, uh, by the United States of the Gulf is actually leading to uh, what has been a long-standing U.S. Uh, uh, ambition, which is to have a true GCC-wide missile defense system. And most of the technology for that will come from the United States, and there, it's quite probable that certain capabilities such as uh, early warning, shared early warning of launches, will also come from the United States. So we're looking at a truly integrated system like we're seeing taking shape in Europe. And how do you foresee the presence of U.S. forces in the region in the near future and uh, larger American interests in the GCC? 
The pivot it was an unfortunate choice of words, but it's important to realize here that the pivot uh, primarily referred to a shift from Europe to Asia, not a shift away from the Middle East in general, and certainly not a shift away from the uh, GCC states that are uh, partnered with the United States. Indeed, um, what you're actually seeing is either a steady state or a relative increase in presence uh, in, the, in the GCC countries. Uh, they still remain critical uh, to the achievement of all of the U.S. national security goals and all of the U.S. Uh, national strategy goals. So the, um, the pivot is, is more or less meaningless in the GCC context. What you are seeing is perhaps a decrease in actual physical forces on the ground in a day-to-day, -day, and that's due to a number of reasons. The first is that a large number of the forces that were in the GCC in the last 10 years had been there to support contingency operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. As those operations draw down, the supporting presence will draw down in a correlating manner. The second reason why you might see a decreased presence, a decreased U.S. presence in the GCC will be just due to the fiscal constraints the U.S. is operating under. And this is a global condition. We simply have fewer particularly large assets such as aircraft carriers that are able to sail on any given day. And so the pattern of coverage is, is, uh, is going to be lesser. Uh, there's going to be more periods of gaps for major capital ships. And then the third uh, reason why you may see this is that I think the strategic guidance going back to the 2006 Defense Quadrennial Defense Review has been to focus on building partner capacity, having more of a train and equip role with our partners so that they can defend themselves, and less of a U.S. capacity because it's realized, particularly in these countries, which are, you know, generally conservative Muslim countries, that. Um, having large numbers of U.S. forces, you know, 18, 19 year old sailors uh, and soldiers, um, has the potential to create friction and problems. And, uh, you know, to the extent that we can accomplish the same security goals with a somewhat lighter, less noticeable footprint and decrease the potential for friction between Americans and the residents of these countries, that's a good thing. Uh, the challenge is the goals everybody agrees on, I think. The challenge is how these are implemented. And the second challenge is um, what message is taken by the primary threat that's seeking to be deterred, and that is Iran. It is quite possible that you know, a change in, say, rotation of aircraft carriers, which is being done for reasons of fiscal probity or because uh, we've decided to reshift our strategy, uh, it's possible that they may misinterpret that as a sign of weakness. And that's really where you get into the art of international politics and international security.